Good morning, everyone. This is Kirsten Logan, the training coordinator from COVA. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're thrilled to have Hazel Heckers and Barney Senna from CBI Victim Support Team here with us today. You will receive an email a little later on this afternoon that is your proof of attendance for this webinar. Please keep that for your records. And if you are applying for COVA Victim Advocacy Certification, submit it with your packet. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel later, we hope that you find it helpful. However, please note that archived webinars may not be used towards COVA certification. You have two handouts. So if you're if you're new to GoToWebinar, you'll see a compressed toolbar in the top right of your screen. There's an orange box with a right-facing arrow. If you click that out, you'll have handouts, and Hazel and Bernie have provided us with two, um, as well as a questions and chat pane, that'll come right to me. We're gonna to get to some polls here in a minute. If you have any trouble answering the polls, exit out of full screen mode. And I'm gonna put a couple uh, links in for upcoming uh, COVA events as well. And with that, uh, Hazel, please take it away. Thanks, Tristan. So thank you all for coming today. I know that you have a lot on your plate and that coming to Another training, um, it's probably a little zoomed out by now, and coming to another training may not be that exciting, so we'll try to make it at least a little bit exciting for you. Um, so my name is Hazel. I work at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. I think many people know me because I've been around forever, um, but may not know my coworker. So Bernie, could you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Bernie Senna. I'm um, one of the bilingual victim advocates with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation um, Victim Support Team. And um, <laughs> Bernie has just recently joined <laughs> us as a full-time victim advocate. Um, she was our part, our, well, she was actually working full-time, but an interim victim advocate with us for six months last year and has just joined us as of January 1st as our full time, no longer interim, full-fledged victim advocate. And some of you may have gone to the Victim Assistance Academy with her. So today we are gonna to talk to you about scams and identity theft and how the pandemic has affected those. So Kirsten, if you could go to the next page, please. So we're going to want you to ask questions. So it's kind of hard in these formats to have that interaction that you would in a live presentation, but we really encourage questions. If we're talking about something that we hear it every day and we know it really well, so we might be using terminology that's not familiar to you, or it may be something that you just don't know what we're talking about or we haven't made clear, or you might have a question if you've seen somebody who's had this happen to them please feel free to ask questions. So I think we're gonna to go to a poll to start with. That's right, and again, any trouble answering the poll, um, it's gonna launch here in a second. You'll wanna exit out of full screen. And this poll is just so that we can know who you are. All right, we're about halfway through our polling response time. This one should be an easy one. <laughs> okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and share that out. So Hazel or Bernie, are you able to see that? I am. Okay, great. Yes, I am. So great. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay. So we're just going to talk to you a little bit about identity theft and cyber crimes. Stay safe. It's just a crazy world out there. And We'll talk a little bit about general scams, general identity theft, and what we're seeing overall. But we do have a couple of um, 
minutes that we want to set aside to talking about domestic violence and identity theft and how the two of them relate to another. This is something that I don't think people talk about very often, and so that's why we wanted to include it. So next slide. Okay, you all know what a predator is, and this is what we normally think of when we think about a predator. When we talk about sexual predators or rape predators, this is what we think about. Next slide, please. Sure, and Hazel, I'm getting a little bit of, um, I don't know if you might be bumping against a mic, or if Bernie, if you're still on, if you might want to uh, mute until you're chatting, because we're getting just some weird little like buzzes. Okay, is this better? Yeah, that's good right now. Okay, so the challenge that we have with identity theft and fraud, that this is what the predators look like. Um, they dress up, they look pretty, they're like the woman sheep's clothing. There's somebody who presents themselves as being your best friend. Um, the reason that they call it con is because they're confidence men or confidence women, people who gain your confidence. And it's through that relationship and that confidence that they steal from you. Okay, next slide, please. So people constantly ask us, well, how do these ID thieves get your information? So here are some of the most common ways. Still the most common way that your identity compromised is through data breaches. This is something that you have no control over. Um, and I think that that's what scares most people is that you don't have any control over the Equifax data breach or a data breach to a system that does background checks or the IRS data breach. These are things completely out of our control, but all of our information is out there and being shared through these. Another and the second most common way that ID thieves get your identity is through scams. They will pull some sort of a scam that convinces you to give them your information. And then again, um, they've got all the information and they can do what they will with it. The next most common way is that you give it to them. You post way too much information about yourself on social media. You tell them things on the phone. There's online communications that give away personal identifying information. Another way that they do it is Google searches. And if you don't believe that Google knows everything about you, just search yourself sometime and you'll find out how much Google knows. Um, it's amazing what you can find in open source, what's just out there if you know what you're looking for. And these scammers are amazing cyber criminals. They know how to find whatever they need to find doing searches. What they can't find, they can hack and find. Hacking is pretty common, though not as, I think most people would say hacking is one of the most common ways to get your identity, and it's not as common as some of these others, but it does happen. And then they do this thing that we call hiding bits and pieces. Where people just give them this information, and your social media gives them that information. And the guys that they pay to go dumpster dive gives them this other information. And when they hack, it gives them this information. And then they call you and scam you and you get that information. Pretty soon they have a complete and total identity put together in little bits and pieces. Another way that people get your identity is just go on the dark web and purchase an identity. And then the final way is that you know the identity thief yourself. It's somebody that you have a personal or intimate relationship with, and they're using your information in a negative way. This could be anything from a domestic partner to a sibling or a cousin or a roommate or someone like that. Okay, next. Okay, and we're I'm still getting some weird, like you sound great much of the time, and I'm still getting some weird kind of metallic sound that, of course, wasn't there when we <laughs> practiced before we started the broadcast, you know, 15 minutes ago. Hazel, so I don't know if you're using, uh, if you, you know, you might want to plug in earphones if you're not using them. I think you were, or um, uh, not quite sure what's going on. It's tolerable, um, but even kind of moving in the, the chair or whatnot, and it looks like someone might be popping in the, the chat to offer us a solution, so I'll look at that. Okay. We'll move on to the next one. No, no, I'm doing everything the same as I was before, and I'm not moving around. Okay, so we'll go to the, the next poll.
Never laugh so you can be honest. All right, we'll do just a few more seconds on the poll. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close that out and share the results. All right, so most folks look like they're aware of it, but it's not something that keeps them awake at night. Well, I'm glad it's not keeping you awake at night, and I'm glad that there are at least a couple of people are a healthy sense of denial and never think about it. Okay, so if we could go on the next slide. That question is that a lot of people really have no idea how easy it is to get your identity. And so we like to know kind of at the beginning, are you worried? Do you think that this might happen? And the healthy response to that was the majority of people who said, you know, I'm aware of it, but it's not it's not interfering in my day. Okay, so during the pandemic, we have seen a few things happen. And the biggest thing that we've seen happen is this isolation of people. Um, just, and I mean, you can read all these through, but you know how it goes. Um, when people are isolated, a lot of that day-to-day -day interaction that keeps you safe is no longer there and it's no longer available. There's also that sense of loneliness that is overwhelming. Okay, next slide, please. And in case you haven't downloaded your handout yet, this presentation is one of your handouts, so you don't have to worry about the notes. It's all in, it'll be in a handout for you. So one of the big complications that we have seen the pandemic create is that everybody does everything on the internet now. Things that used to be done face-to-face -face are being done either online or through some internet format. And that frequency of computers increases your risk. It increases risk for a couple of reasons. First of all, you're using them a lot. And so the more you use it, the more you are. But also, you get really, really comfortable using them and having communications that way and having all of your relationships online. And that makes you more vulnerable, too, because you may be giving out information that you don't know you're giving out. Um, social media has a really big way for people to share information um, and to connect, which is great that it's there, but people might also be sharing too much information on social media. And then the other thing are things like online gatherings. If it's something like this where it's controlled, then you know who you're online with. But online gatherings, you don't know who's there. And when you share all the personal information, you could be sharing it with any thief. There's some things we've seen that Zoom gallery um, and other similar things where people hack into meetings that are in progress. And if you have personal identifying information, being shared in those meetings, then, you know, it's going to be shared with whoever hacks in. The other thing that people are not always aware of, I think they've become aware of it now, is what's in the background. Are you sharing information in the background when you're on one of these meetings or a Google Meets or FaceTiming? Is there stuff in your background that you don't want other people to see because they're seeing it? So it just have become a little bit oblivious to that kind of thing. Um, and then also the fact that there are a lot of people who are online now who never were before. And for them, that lack of experience can lead to a lot of vulnerability to, to identity thieves. Okay, next slide, please. So we all know that first stuff that we don't think about, we probably don't think about. And one of the things that they know are that older adults are more isolated now than they ever were before. And a lot of them are using the internet for the first time or using it more than they used to. And so it's a great time to do internet based scans for older adults and to target them. They also know that it's really to get a phone call. 
I don't know about you, but I like getting phone calls every once in a while. It's nice to talk with somebody through text, but I, I just want to hear their voice every once in a while. And they know, predators know that there's a lot of people who are wanting to do that. Anybody who has been a victim of unemployment fraud, which Bernie will talk about in a minute, knows how much you can get put on hold um, if you're trying to get through to somebody. And the predators know how much we hate automated systems and we hate being put on hold, and they will never ever put somebody on hold. They'll never transfer you. They'll never have to wait to talk to somebody. They are right there to be supportive of you. And they also use social media um, being a primary form of communication is a great way for them to kind of sneak their way in um, to you, either messaging on Facebook or meeting on one of the sites. Okay, next, please. So this was actually on the internet um, and not as a joke. Following this, there was an, a whole thing about where you could put your money and what forms of um, currency were accepted by this person to give this to you. Um, and you got nothing in return because this is just one of many, many scams. So I just put this in there to let you know, most of you would never fall for this, but there's people out there who would. They would say, oh yeah, there's a lot of scams. Well, for 20 bucks, I can find out how to avoid them and would send the information in. Okay, next please. Okay, so I am gonna mute my microphone so that you can hear Bernie and I'm gonna let Bernie take it away for a few minutes. Okay, um, so unemployment fraud, it has been a huge um, scam that's been going on that has affected not only Colorado, but the entire US we've been discovering. Um, Let's see. What they do is they start off by um, filing unemployment claims, and most people are realizing this when they either receive a reliable card in the mail or they get a letter from unemployment um, letting them know that this is their case number and this is their PIN number. Um, we've also seen a huge increase in people receiving um, 1099G forms. Um, and also, um, one of the more recent scams that we've been coming across with unemployment is they are receiving phone calls um, from someone stating that they are from the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment and that they have been overpaid um, and that they can remake the payments back to them um, and, um, by purchasing like gift cards and stuff. And a lot of these people are thinking that they're needing to pay this back. So they are falling for these scams. Um, let's see. We do have a website. Um, it's cdivictimsupport.com. And we have an unemployment fraud page that kind of lists out the steps for everybody to go through where they can find all the information needed to report these scams in one location. Um, we've heard from many victims that they've spent hours on the phone um, trying to get a hold of somebody and after two hours, it says they don't have any appointment plans and it ends up on them, or they just keep getting the runaround with different automated systems. Um, so they're not getting answers um, to questions that they have or concerns, um, or even how to report any of this. So having that information centralized has been a huge help to a lot of them. Um, let's see, what else? Um, we do suggest that people um, report to the three credit bureaus. Um, that way they can put a lock on their social security number. Um, pulling their credit reports, we've seen that while some people pull their credit reports, um, most have nothing, but we have discovered that some do have other inquiries from other states or unemployment claims um, that they were unaware about. Um, that's one thing that we have them looking out for now as well. Ernie, it's Kirsten. We've got a question. Um, how do people know to file a false unemployment claim in, in your name? Or is it just kind of like luck of the draw, like they try a social security number and, and you might pop up? Um, so we're not quite sure how they're coming up with the information, but usually um, people are notified by either receiving any of the letters and 
a lot of them are being notified by their employers that an unemployment claim was filed while they are still currently working at that, that business. Um, and so once they've been notified of this and they, they themselves have not filed for unemployment, we ask for them to report that. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see. If we can go to the next slide, we'll just go on. And if you have any other questions about the unemployment stuff, just let us know. Um, while we're oh, there we go. I think in the handout, that's one of your uh, resources in the one pager, right? Is, it uh, is. It great. Is. Our website is there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll out and off and share. I am really surprised that so many people are saying no, um, because I would say that more than 50% of the people in any of that you talk to have been a victim of it. So I'm really surprised. Well, I'm glad you haven't been a victim for those of you who have not. But as, but as you can see, I mean, with even just small group having, I think it was 20% say yes, that's the victim. And that's a lot of people to be the victim of the same fraud identity theft. And this is one of those fraud identity theft combos. For the state, it's fraud. For the individual, it's identity theft. And we think that they're getting your identities through a data breach. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we have seen a lot of new stories that have been related specifically to the pandemic. Um, you know, the stimulus funds, these are things you can kind of expect. Um, phishing calls saying, we'll help you get your money faster, we'll help you more. Um, those have been pretty common, um, especially with the first round. But then as we got that second check, we saw them coming back again. We also see an ongoing issue, which is elder abuse and elder financial exploitation um, of care facilities, assisted living facilities, um, nursing homes, that sort of thing, taking the stimulus check and saying that it's income that belongs to the facility, not to the individual, which is not how it was intended. So that is a form of exploitation. Uh, we've also seen a lot of treatment team cure things. Now we're seeing a lot of vaccination problems with people saying that you can sign up for vaccination faster here. You don't have to wait your turn. Just sign up with us. Uh, we'll get it to you. You have to fill out a form that has all of your personal identifying information on it, and you also have to pay for it. You will never get a vaccination through this. They will take your money and they'll take your information. And that's all you'll see. Well, we have here, the East Coast has to fake vaccination sites getting set up in parking lots at, you know, big box stores where you can see people standing out there saying, you know, come here and get your vaccination. And then people line up, they give their personal identifying information, they pay for something, um, and they get a saline solution shot. So they're not protected, they paid money, and they gave out all their personal identity information. So like I said, we haven't seen that here in Colorado, but usually if it hits one of the coasts, eventually it comes to us. And then we've seen the usual, you know, we have a cure, we can help the immune system, we've got the treatment, come to, we know more than anybody else. Okay, bye, please. We've also seen a lot with testing. Um, get it here faster, it's easy to do it here. You don't have to have a doctor. But one of the horrible things that we've seen happening in the older community is people getting phone calls saying, if you let us come and test you and you test negative, and you have to for that test, then we'll go test your family members and if they test negative too, you can see each other. 
So we'll make it so that your family can be together. That was really good around the holidays. And I just think that's a horrible thing to do because, you know, they're not testing anything. And then the big one that we is tech tracing, um, where these criminals will tell you they need access to your smartphone, they can track who you've been around, or they'll send you a text that says, you've been exposed to somebody who has tested positive. If you click on this link, we'll tell you more. Um, and then they'll also send you a text saying, we think you may have been exposed. If you send us your information, we'll to you know. But the information that they ask, I don't know about you, but none of my friends know my social security number. So I don't think my social security number would tell me or tell any who I've been hanging out with, but that's one of the questions that they ask. And then the other one is, we know you've been exposed and for a dollar amount, we'll tell you where you were exposed and how you were exposed and let you get a test. Okay, next please. And then we've seen some of the same things we've seen before. Um, extortion scams, you know, the, um, we know what you did last night, we hacked into your computer, we turned your webcam, we have a video of you pleasuring people watching porn, and we're gonna give it out to everybody and their brother if you don't fork over some Bitcoin. Um, so we've seen that happen a lot. Um, if we have enough time i'll tell you a funny story about that we've seen a lot of work from home with so many people out of work it just is so tempting to fall for some of the work at home scams um and one of the big things is that they send check in advance and have you cash that check and do things with a dollar amount whether it's mystery shopping or um, forwarding the money out to someone else converting it into gift cards any of that uh, that check is fraudulent and it's gonna bounce and so people are out a lot of money you have seen that loved one in trouble you may know it more as the granny scam the in the middle of the night hey grandpa is that you it's me your grandson i'm in big trouble and they need to send me money that was changed a little bit during the pandemic now it's someone who calls me and says are you the grandparent of and then they want your grandchildren and then they tell you your grandchild is in the hospital in another state. Um, they have COVID-19, they're having respiratory problems, they're in distress, they could be on a ventilator, but our hospital has run out of ventilators. There's some at another hospital that we would purchase for your grandson, but he needs to pay up front and he doesn't have the money. If you wire us $6,000, you can save your grandson's life. If you don't, well, you know, he may just die. So a lot of people who might not have ever fallen for the, I've been arrested and need bail money scam, will fall for this one. So, you know, we're, we're really trying to warn people that this is a scam, that hospitals are not asking for money to put someone on a ventilator. Um, and that the best course of action is to, Stop and call that loved one and see where they are, if they're okay. Um, remote accessing your computer is a big one that we're seeing. There's the typical Microsoft scam that we've seen for years. Um, this is Microsoft calling the problem with your computer. Um, but the one that we're seeing more now is you get a, a frantic phone call or a message saying that something is wrong with your order from Amazon. Amazon and Apple seem to be the two that are the, the companies that, that these scammers are picking on. Amazon and Apple have nothing to do with it except that they're just huge. And so their chances of getting somebody who has an Amazon or Apple account is pretty good. Um, and they say there's a problem. You know, that $6,000 computer chip, we can't get it to you. There's a delivery problem. You say, oh my gosh, I never ordered that. Well, let's get into your Amazon account and fix it. So you pull up your Amazon account. They can't figure it out. They need to remote access in. So they're seeing the same thing you're seeing and so that they can fix the problem. While they're in there, they're not only installing spyware, but they're also downloading all of the files. So that if you have a file, something like your taxes or medical files, anything with your personal information on it, they now have all of that. Um, and they try other scams after that. Often, if they're able to get your bank account information, by the time you're off phone with them and they tell you everything is cleared up, 
they have gone into your bank account and cleaned it out. So we have seen a lot of that. There and are the two, you know. Oh, hey, yeah. sorry, we had a question going back to the hospital. And folks, I do apologize for the audio. Um, it looks like when we went live with the broadcast. Uh, it just didn't get a great audio connection. I've been chatting with GoToWebinar support and there, there would be nothing to be done about it except to end and restart the broadcast, which um, I don't feel great about doing. So I think folks are still getting uh, the point. Thank you for hanging with us. And Hazel, a question was about the hospital, the, you know, your grandchild is in the hospital scam. Um, is that, you know, an email that looks like it is from a hospital? Are those phone calls typically? They're typically phone calls. Um, I don't think they check calls because you have enough time to then call your family member. But if they have you on the phone, they can create an urgency for it. And they do sound quite legitimate. Um, you know, it's somebody who um, actually speaks English without much of an accent and sounds like they know what they're talking about. They throw around a lot of medical jargon and terminology. Um, they will introduce themselves as either a patient representative or a nurse from, and the a hospital that actually exists, you know, from Mount Sinai Hospital or something like that. So, and they use a lot of language that indicates that they are at least the TV version of schooled in medical science. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. So, you know, I think that the rest of these, the only other one that I wanted to talk about a lot is the romance scam. You all know what the romance scams are, um, but we have seen through the Federal Trade Commission who tracks the reporting, of this, we have seen a 40% increase in spam scams since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's huge. I don't think with the exception of unemployment fraud that we have seen any other specific scam increase that much in such a short period of time. Um, so that is a lot of people who are falling in love online um, and unfortunately are falling in love with scam artists. And then just something to be aware of, you may be getting a lot of phishing email text messages um, saying that your favorite store is giving you a gift card as a, an extra stimulus or a thank you. Um, that you can get a gun with a with no background um, check if you just fill out the form. Um, and then a big one is coming from what looks like FedEx or UPS saying there's been a problem with your delivery. Well, if you click here, we can verify your address and get your delivery to you. But you have the delivery. Okay, next. And I am sorry about the audio. Um, so just real quickly, domestic violence and ID theft, and I'll really go through these next couple of things quickly because I want to get to our prevention tips pretty quickly. But if you have questions, feel free to, to ask. One of the is identity theft and domestic violence is an abuser and you have had a relationship. Therefore, they know all of your personal identifying information, PII. Um, the abuser probably has access to your social security card, your birth certificate, your driver's license, any immigration paperwork like your green card, um, any other forms of ID that you have, and they may withhold them from you as part of the abuse. Um, they have access to your children's personal identifying information and documents too, and that just allows them to exert another form of control over you. We have seen some very creative abusers who will go out of their way to ruin their credit before that partner has a chance to leave. And they do that to make it harder for you to leave. If you try to leave, but you have bad credit and you can't get housing and you can't get them because of that, they can say, oh, honey, just come on back home. Um, and then after leaving, we see a lot of them using their ID to commit crime. Um, one of those is getting pulled over for a traffic stop and using your information saying that, you know, their your social security, they don't have your their ID on them, but their name is such and such, and here's their social security number, and it's you instead of 
of them and then they don't show up for it and you're the one who gets the failure to appear um, warrant out for you. They'll also run up a lot of debt in your name after you've left. And they sometimes, because if there was a conviction, you know, they can't legally get a firearm, but maybe their new girlfriend or boyfriend or whomever um, will pose as you and purchase a firearm in your name. And they just use all of these uh, form to discredit you and you look like you're not stable. It's also a way to gain control of the children and their fears so that they can use that as a bargaining chip to get them back. Okay, next slide. We also see a with domestic violence for stalking. Um, one of the big issues with cyber stalking is that it's relatively new as far as law enforcement's response to it goes. It is very, very hard to prove. So it's it's a great form of stalking um, for people who are just, you know, really cruel. Stalking happens text with emails, with phone hacking, um, all sorts of ways, getting into your social media, taking that over. When they are close to you or know you, there can be an installation uh -huh. of tracking and spyware devices in your phones or on your computers. Um, they can post profiles on dating and hookup websites, which I think is especially cool, but we're seeing it more, that after a person leaves a relationship, their abuser will then go to multiple dating sites and they choose the ones that are more hookup sites than dating sites, and they will post that their, their victim's profile, their picture, um, sometimes their new address, um, and they'll say things like, I'm just looking for somebody to hook up with, or I have a rape fantasy, will you fulfill it? All sorts of horrific things. And then you as the victim don't even get there. Um, the other thing that we do see is the sharing of compromising the mind. Um, and email takers, and then putting false information about you on the people search site. Okay. Are there any questions about those two topics, the cyberstock and domestic violence and ID theft? Give folks a moment to type if they're thinking. Okay, nothing at the moment. I'll definitely let you know if someone pops in. Okay. So now we're just going to talk a little bit about what you can do. So next slide, please. Okay, we have a poll. And Hazel, you are still seeing the poll results, right? I have been, yes. Great. Okay, about five more seconds to vote. All right, I'm going to close that and share it out. Okay, well, I am really happy to see that most of you think it's very difficult. Because we get a lot of calls from people who say, I just want my social security number changed. If they have my social, I want it changed. Why can't I change it? And just get really upset when I realize that it is anywhere between difficult and nearly impossible to change your social security number. Not completely impossible, but very, very difficult. Okay, next slide, please. Great, and we had a question pop in um, asking, does, uh, does Snapchat really disappear your information or is Snapchat you know, then saving that information? Or do you know? <laughs> 
Well, um, I could answer this one. Okay, Bernie. I was just going to ask you, Bernie, to um, answer that. <laughs> so while the information does erase um, after it's been sent, your phone still keeps a log of these files, um, which in most cases, most people won't know how to um, get them back. But it is very possible that someone who does know or is good with computers can get that information back off of those those logs. So it's not completely erased. Okay, thank you. Seems like nothing is anymore. No. <laughs> nope, I think it's fair to say that if it's on the internet, it never goes away, wouldn't you say, Bernie? I would definitely have to agree with that because it is stored somewhere on a server somewhere in the cloud. So it's always out there once it's been sent um, over over a device or internet or anything like that. So I'm going to very quickly go over a couple of things that you might want to consider, especially for those of you who work with a lot of domestic violence cases um, related to identity theft. and. Uh, Let's be real. I know that identity theft is not the highest priority most of the time when you come into contact with people who are victims of domestic violence, but it is something to consider, especially if you have a longer term relationship with that person. So consider uh, talking with people about securing documents as part of their safety. So when you're talking with somebody who is currently in an active violent relationship, you know, talk to them about their safety planning for their physical safety, but also mention, you know, secure those documents somewhere um, at a bank or at a friend's house or somewhere where you might be able to access those documents quickly if you need to leave. Um, I would suggest, you know, checking credit and bank before leaving if that's at all possible. And I know for a lot of people it's not, but if it is, that's a great plan so that you know in advance how much you have been compromised. And then I would consider ID theft um, something to address in the early stages of leaving. So if somebody is at a shelter and they're getting ready to leave shelter, you know, their 30 days or how many days they have are coming to an end, start thinking about how ID theft may impact their ability to get housing after they leave. And then start working on correcting that as quickly as possible. Um, and then one of the things that I think we don't often do, but could, and when it when we do ask for it, judges are usually inclined to support this, is to consider asking for the use of your identity and for stalking action to be included in any protection order and including the children. A lot of people don't even think to ask for that, but judges are pretty willing to put it on there and say, yeah, you can't use this person's ID or their children's ID and cyber stalking will be a violation of this protection order. But a lot of cases, if you don't have it spelled out, then it's gonna be harder for you to say that's a protection order violation. And then um, I would say get an ID theft expert, like one of us at CBI involved as soon as possible, um, just to help out with some of those pieces. And then, if you have the need to talk to it to get your victims connected with an attorney, I think that's great because the credit reporting agencies consider your credit and your spouse's credit to be the same thing until there's a divorce or some sort of a court order that says that they're separate. So even separated before the divorce, the abuser can go on accruing large amounts of credit in your name and according to the credit reporting bureaus there's nothing wrong with that so you want to get um, some legal assistance as soon as possible around that and then i would say just document every single act of cyber -working. a lot of people just don't document enough and the big thing is don't try to do it alone get some help get somebody who knows what they're doing to help you with that okay next please and i'm going to have Bernie um, jump in here anytime she wants to. But for cyber stalking, the big thing to tell you is document, 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 every single thing, document it. Um, don't try to clean up your phones and your devices yourself. Get a pro to do that. Um, correct anything online or on social media sites that you can. And if you can't, 
shut it down. Shut down that, so I'm not painful, but shut down that Facebook page. Change your email, whatever, and start fresh. Um, and then use all the privacy protections that are available. One thing we encourage people to do is Google image search yourself. And that just tells you if your ex is using you um, or your cyber stalker and you on any of the dating sites. And then there is such a thing called a LexisNexis opt out. And if you need some help with that, give us a call. But you can just Google it and it will give you the form so that you can opt of having your name and your information appear on a lot of online sites. And I think we might have a poll next. We're asking yeah. so many polls mm -hmm. because we don't have an opportunity to talk to you in person and ask these things. And I'll be super interested how to do a Google image search on yourself because I don't actually know. So here we go with the poll. Okay, about 10 more seconds to vote. Okay, we're going to close that out and share it. Well, good to see that a lot of people have Googled themselves. It can be surprising. Okay, see you. And then the next one is about a credit freeze. Okay, you want to do the, the last poll next, Hazel? Yeah, let's do that, and then we'll talk about the two of them. Okay. Here we go. Okay, about 10 more seconds to vote. Oh, it's good to see that a lot of people know um, what a credit freeze is and that a lot of you have one in place. So that's good. So I am going to turn this over to Bernie now to talk a little bit about what Google image search is and to do that. And then to talk a little bit about some of the prevention tips, including a credit. So it's all yours, Bernie. Bernie, are you there? Yes, I am. I actually just forgot to take myself off of you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Um, so basically, when you do a Google image search, um, you can go to Google image. Um, they do have a reverse search. And basically, you put a photo of yourself um, in there and any photos. Um, similar to yours will pop up. Um, a lot of those, a lot of times, like they're associated with your social media accounts. Um, you know, there's other forms where if you've ever submitted a photo for anything that it could possibly be up there. Um, if your name is associated with a photo, um, they're all out there. Um, we do recommend doing that, um, especially with your if you do have any social media um, to take those profile pictures and do a reverse image search on those because those are usually the ones that they have access to and they'll pull them and use them for other um, websites especially with um, catfishing um, websites they'll use them for dating apps and create like this whole fake um, profile using your photos um, when you do discover those you can contact that particular um, website and then ask that it be removed. Um, let's see. 
same thing with like when you Google your own name to look at those and see the different websites that pop up with those um, and having those removed as well. Google has their own opt-out um, where you can email them and ask them to have those links and stuff removed. Um, and each, um, let's see, there's a lot of those like people finder um, type of websites that you can go to as well that also have that option to have them removed um, whenever you find that information on there, which I do recommend doing. Um, you know, at least every three months, because as you give out information, new information gets put up on the internet. So I would recommend doing a Google search of yourself every couple months and then going through and seeing if that's information that you would like to have removed. Um, there's a lot of websites that have a lot of personal information, such as your name, your address, your phone numbers. Um, a lot of them are current. They give relative information as well. Um, so I would just recommend like doing that and having that information removed because it makes it a lot easier for someone who's cyber stalking you to get that information. And then cyber stalking can end up going from online to offline. Um, let's see. Does anybody have any questions about Google reverse imaging searching or Googling themselves? Nothing yet at the moment. Let me know when you're ready for to need to advance the slide as well oh, as well. Okay. Um, let's see. The credit freezes also. Um, hold on. Let's see. So the credit freezes, um, we definitely recommend those, especially when you have your information that's been compromised, whether it's by a data breach or anything else, um, even just in general, because this is gonna be the safest way for you to protect your identity. Um, it basically prevents anybody from pulling that credit out in your name using your social. Um, I have heard that it's a pain sometimes to get it removed when you need something, but it's better to have that in place than to have it not and then have someone have access to all this information. Um, I think you can go ahead and advance to the next one. Um, I'll, I'll go over some of the internet tips, but Hazel will go ahead and jump in whenever. Um, one of the things with um, being safe online is when you log into any of your devices, always make sure that you have your two-factor authentication um, turned on because a lot of this information that um, these cyber stalkers get actually comes from you personally. Um, a lot of people will use, you know, like their text name as their password. And on your social media, you're posting pictures of you and your pup booster, and that actually happens to be your, you know, your password. So um, definitely, Turn on the two-factor authentication. That way it's asking for your password and your fingerprint or even your face detection. Um, that's gonna be very helpful in preventing anybody from getting your information. Um, the other thing is never click on links. Um, a lot of information is gathered by clicking on these links or you're giving somebody access to install um, spyware, malware, um, any of those things by clicking on the links. You're basically opening um, especially when people are doing like phishing scams, they'll send an email from what looks to be like a legitimate company and you click on the link and then you, they now have access. Um, same thing goes for with remote sharing. Do not give anybody access to your computer like those Amazon scams where they say they can go in and correct everything if you let them have access to the computer where they've been. Install spyware and then they have access to your important documents and files. Um, huge on the do not overshare on social media. Again, um, cyber stalkers have a way of going to your social media and you're posting personal details, um, such as, you know, the like where you work or where you check in. A lot of times when you check into something, 
try not to check in um, or post things in real time because in that list, the cyber stalker know either you're not at home or you're eating lunch somewhere and they can go stalk you that way. Um, or the people that you're with and then they stalk their profiles and get more information from you that way. Um, in an ideal world, we would recommend that you not use your real name when using profiles, um, although sometimes that's not possible, but try not to give as much personal details like your full name um, when you use social media. Um, or, you know, like your user handles, such like that. Um, the one thing that we have been seeing lately is people posting pictures of themselves with their COVID vaccination cards. Um, that also contains your full name and other information that you probably don't want people sharing. Um, so you can go ahead and go on to the next page. Um, always keep your up, always keep your electronic devices updated to the latest software. Um, this will help protect against any. Um, I'm sorry, it will help protect against you if anybody is trying to install these types of malware. Um, usually some, you could add an additional virus program onto your phone to look for those. Anything that's not um, certified through like Google or Apple, they will let you know that this is a risk where um, they'll ask if you want to install it or have it removed. Um, those run daily. Um, again, never give out your personal information. Never give out your bank information. Um, do not share your passwords with anybody. Um, make sure to use reliable password managers if you do have those. I know a lot of people are really into, um, I forget what it's called, but it's basically a program and it, and it keeps track of all your passwords. I know like Google has that where you can just put in your password and then you use your biometrics to use that. Um, while it's convenient, it's also not safe. Um, so it could be compromised just as well. Uh, let's see. Again, once you post something online, um, it's very hard to have it removed. So just be careful what you're posting out there. As far as the passwords go, I strongly recommend that you don't use just a one word password, that you use passphrases um, such as today is a beautiful day and include numbers, special characters in, mixed in there because it makes it harder for a hacker to come in and decrypt that password. Um, as they do have programs that do this um, and they go through the basic. Um, words and they try them and they can get lots of words out there in a few minutes so the longer your password is um, the more complex it is the harder it is for someone to track that um, and then it's not personally related to you where they can easily figure that out by going through social media um the scams as far as scams go if you do feel like there is um like something just doesn't sound right and it, it, it sounds like a scam, you're more than welcome to hang up on them. Get a callback number, um, call one of us, and then we can help you determine whether or not that is a scam or not. And the next one. Okay, excellent. And looks like we're pretty close up on time, but I know that Hazel and Bernie were available to be you know, over for a few more minutes and finish up. Just wanted to acknowledge if folks do need to drop off, the contact information will be in your handouts. Don't forget to download those and we're gonna um, press through. So this is the, just kind of the end of our presentation. We just wanted to do a final reminder that, you know, you may not be falling for any of these scams and giving out your information about giving somebody a review, so please share. And next slide, please. Don't forget yourself. Take care of yourself. We always like to include this in our presentations. And then next slide, please. So this is our tagged information. Um, the three of us who are all the time, plus our um, some online sources. And again, you have this in your handout. And the next slide, please. 
we do have 24 hour support line that you can call um, and hit that number. And I think we have like a, about a minute or so more slides, please. And this is our website. So thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. We hope you learned something. Um, please call us if you have questions. Visit our website and we'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody has more questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hazel and Bernie. Uh, really appreciate it. And that's amazing to have a 24-hour helpline. And, you know, I know ID theft, you know, it's not a VRA crime, which, but not to say that it isn't absolutely devastating to folks. So we're appreciative you're, that you're there to, to help everyone. So I'm going to mute as well, but we will still be here for uh, a few more minutes so folks can ask any remaining questions. Thank you so much and enjoy your lunch. Are you seeing any questions, Kirsten? No, looks like folks are headed out to lunch. So with that, I'm gonna tell you ladies, thank you so much and go ahead and um, end our broadcast. Okay, great, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.